Dr. Wilms is a CEO of the Learning Bar and a professor at the University of New Brunswick. He's the president of the International Academy of Education, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Education, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He recently held the Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Literacy and Human Development for 14 years. Dr. Wilms has published over 200 research articles and monographs pertaining to youth literacy, children's health, the accountability of schooling systems, and the assessment of national reforms. He developed the Educational Prosperity Framework, which he'll speak about today, over the course of his career, which is used by jurisdictions in their capacity building efforts and the development of educational policy. The model has been adopted by the OECD for PISA for development, an initiative aimed at building capacity for low and middle income countries to monitor progress towards nationally set targets for improvement. Dr. Wilms and his colleagues have developed the questionnaires and the analysis plan for this international study as well. So today, Dr. Wilms will discuss the theoretical underpinnings of educational prosperity and how prosperity outcomes and the foundations for school success have been measured in Alberta's schools. He will also set out explicit definitions of equality and uh, equity and describe some simple statistics for their measurement at various levels of the schooling system. So please welcome Dr. Wilms. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> Great. Um, this is actually a perfect place to have our first National Insights meeting for a number of reasons. I think uh, Alberta was the first province that we had a provincial contract to do Tell Them From East survey, now called Our School. Edmonton was the um, genesis of the early years evaluation. We had a few small initiatives going, but it was really Edmonton Public and then shortly thereafter Edmonton Catholic that really got us going. Uh, the first year that we did it here, we did a little pilot study and found that um, the early years results correlated something like 0.95, very high correlation with the results of the traditional ways of doing business and saved $400,000 uh, in program, in, in testing fees, which actually is money can be used for testing. Uh, and so it, it very quickly got adopted by 10 more districts and now almost all districts are using early years evaluation. Alberta is also um, a home to two of the schools that are using Confident Learners, which I'll talk about. It's a program for developing literacy skills of indigenous students in the country. Uh, we've been working with uh, uh, a couple of schools here and, and now we're, we're just on the verge of, of going, uh, bringing it into the public schools. Uh, and we're, we're quite excited about that program. So those are the three big pieces that we have in our, in our company. And in addition, as Peter mentioned, I'm heavily involved in PISA for development. And in fact, at seven o'clock this morning, we had this huge culminating meeting of the, for our technical advisory group for PISA. And it's members of the main PISA study. And I had to present what we've done to develop the questionnaires uh, for PISA for development. And I'll say a little bit about that later. Um, as they go along. I'm going to talk about educational prosperity and actually that, that's apropos about PISA for Development because um, PISA for Development is a study of trying to bring PISA into low and middle income countries. Middle income are, are countries that has, have a gross national income of only $12,000 per person or lower. Low income is 6000 so they're very, they're very poor countries. We have seven countries involved, Guatemala, Honduras, Ecuador, Paraguay, Senegal, Zambia, and Cambodia. And I was on my way to, um, well, I met with a minister in Guatemala, and I asked her, why are you wanting to belong, why are you wanting to do PISA? You're me measuring the skills of kids at 15 years old, math, reading, and science. And she said, yeah, but we just need to know what that magic bullet is. Is it teacher-student relations? Is it classroom disciplinary climate? Now, you have to realize that the kids in these countries um, in, in these low-income countries, they have, if you know PISA, it has six levels. About two-thirds of these kids are down at level one and level two. So they're very poor outcomes. And so you can't imagine that in grade 10 you're going to come up with this magic bullet to change classroom climate and think that they're going to magically come up to score. So I, I went away and I started developing this whole model, which was eventually 
accepted by PISA, by the o Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And now it's being used in some of our jurisdictions that are, are using the R-School survey. So it's called Educational Prosperity in Alberta Schools. Um, I'm going to use some examples from Alberta as much as possible. Some of them are old slides, some of them are fairly new slides. So this is an old slide. It's an old slide because my daughter, who is now 22, is the little girl on the right there. This was the book we did on, um, on our National Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth, um, talking about all the factors, the, the risk factors that were related to childhood vulnerability. Notice the, uh, the journal there, so there's, there's lots of things about Alberta here. So when I um, go back, when I, when I did this work, we came out with the idea that there was, um, we had all these definitions of vulnerability and so on, and then Human Resources Development Canada said, yes, but how many vulnerable children are there in Canada? I said, how do you answer a question like that? It depends on how you define it and where you do the cut points. And anyway, we, d we did the work and developed cut points for health and well-being and for academic achievement and so on came out with this figure of 28 percent and um, it was in the national press. I'm sitting in my home office and a chief statistician of the time, Ivan Flegge, calls me and said, that's ridiculous. There's no way that three out of every ten Canadian children are vulnerable. But I stuck to my guns because that matched the, if you looked at the percentage of kids that dropped out of school, the percentage of kids who had anxiety and depression issues and so on, you come up to 28 percent quite readily. And you'll see in a moment that it also lines up with PISA. So my question is, can we reduce vulnerability from, say, 28 or 30 percent down to 20 percent? What, what would it take? Here are the data for Alberta from PISA. So PISA is a program of international student assessment. Those of you who are not familiar with it. In this case, it's reading scores. And the average for the OECD countries is 500. Standard deviation is 100. Those of you who are a little rusty on your stats, the standard, about two-thirds of everyone is plus or minus one standard deviation, so between 400 and 600, and about 95% of everyone is between plus or minus two standard deviations, 300 and 700. And the average for the OECD is 500, so Alberta is well above the average, and in fact, in the year 2000, the first year of the study, um, they had the highest scores in Canada, and if Alberta had been participating as a country, they would have been right up there with, with Finland. You can see the scores have been just dropping a little bit each year. So you're no longer the highest scoring province, uh, or, or, or if you were a country, it wouldn't be the highest scoring country either. Um, but more important, I want you to look at kids who are level two and level one. Kids who are level two and level one have very low literacy scores. Um, we can't put a grade level on it, but I'd suggest it's down around the grade level two would be down around the grade four, grade five level, level one even lower. So those kids, what we do know is kids who have level two scores after they finish high school have a very difficult time going on to any kind of post-secondary and have trouble getting jobs. And kids who have level one scores have trouble even getting jobs. So how many? We got about 30% in Alberta. Again, back to this figure of 30% who were vulnerable. We also like to look at it at school level and say, so this is just the y-axis now. Oh, I didn't even mention what the x, the x-axis here is a measure of socioeconomic status. Socioeconomic status refers to people's um, access and control over wealth, prestige, and power. Uh, we measure it practically by looking at students, uh, their parents' uh, level of education, the occupations they're in, and the um, uh, well, we like to measure income, but 15-year-olds don't know their parents' income. Uh, so we have this measure of educational possessions in the home. And just as a little aside, that whole meeting this morning, most of it was about how to measure socioeconomic status and poverty in these low-income countries, because that scale doesn't go low enough. You see you've got some kids way down at minus 2 on the x-axis, but in these countries they go down to minus 4, so some really poor, poor kids. So then we can aggregate the data at the school level and say how well are the schools doing. And when I go into it, look at the data for a school district or a country um, or a province, I like to do one of these profiles because it tells you 
really quickly how spread out the schools are this way in terms of their socioeconomic status. Do you have schools for the rich and schools for the poor? And then how are they spread out this way? Do you have some schools that are just for high-flying, really bright kids and other schools that are more for kids with low scores? So Alberta's got quite a nice even profile. You're fairly evenly clustered. Those gray dots are the rest of the Canadian schools. So that, that's a good thing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And here's another thing about the 30% point. If you look at the gross domestic product of countries, as when you, this is the percentage of kids who have scores below level three. So remember, these are the kids who have, are vulnerable in that sense. And when you get below a gross domestic product of 10,000, you get real high levels of vulnerability, and then it comes down and levels off. And Canada's pretty good. We're sitting in there around 30% not quite as good as Finland, has a little lower. So I, I mentioned about this educational prosperity, and I think we, we really need a new assessment framework from our traditional ways of doing business. The idea of collecting test scores at certain grade levels, and then going on a, a hunt, or I call it the quest for school effects. What are the correlates of school effectiveness? That model, it has some merits, but it isn't doesn't tell the full story. So imagine that you might have a test score. What do you, what do, you do? Three ages, grades three, six, and nine in Alberta? Your, your test, provincial testing, yeah. So you've got your grade nine test scores, say, academic achievement, and people think, oh, this is how well our kids in grade nine are doing, what's going on in our school, that brought them to this point. And then we start with things like tell them from me and, and uh, so on, we say, what are the factors that are driving those scores? And you need to know those. Um, and so we had 20 years of research looking at what are the correlates of school effects? What are the factors that drive that some schools, if I go back, uh, what, are, what are some of the characteristics of those schools at the top of that distribution that are doing really well given their socioeconomic status. So if you go up from zero, say, kids serving average, schools serving average kids, how come some of them are doing well and some of them are not doing as well? So that's that little green arrow. Those are the current drivers. But educational prosperity suggests that there's that prior success, starting not at birth, but right from conception, are much stronger drivers of those outcomes at age 15. Educational prosperity identifies four ways that success accumulates. So it includes a core set of metrics for success at six different developmental stages across the life course from conception to adolescence. And those metrics include key outcomes for each developmental stage. You'll see those in a minute. And we call those prosperity outcomes. It also includes some of the drivers of those outcomes at each stage, which we call the foundations for success. And I'm going to talk about the four ways that success accumulates over the lifespan. As I'm talking about those four ways, I've inserted the work of the learning bar that talks about our different programs, namely year to years evaluation, confident learners, and the our school surveys. So, you probably can't see this, um, and don't worry, because these little stages will be presented separately as I go along. But the idea is, if you look along the bottom row there, we've got six stages, prenatal, early development, uh, from age zero to two, pre-primary, from three to five, early primary, and so on, all the way up to upper secondary. And then what are the outcomes that you want to achieve at each of those stages? And Someone could say, but aren't those culturally bound? I mean, aren't the outcomes from Alberta different from Saskatchewan or BC? So we strive to come up with some universal outcomes, and then a province can add to those, if you like. There's some countries, for example, want to have learning a second language as a, as a key outcome at one of the stages. But generally, these are hard outcomes to disagree with. You want to have healthy pregnancy, healthy deliveries, you want to have good language development, cognitive development, physical development at the next stage, and so on. And then when you get to the upper stages, 
you want to have academic achievement, educational attainment, health and well-being, and engagement. And so it's really those, the last three stages where our school fits in, that pre-primary stage is where the early years evaluation fits in, and, and the fourth stage, the early primary, is also where competent learners fits in. So the four ways that success developments develops, it's through biological embedding, foundations for success, cumulative effects, and selection. So here's a little heuristic, I guess, that shows you the idea, the main idea of educational prosperity. You've got your six stages there on the prosperity outcomes, shown in the, in the circles at the top. And then you've got the foundations for success. Those are those green rectangles along the bottom. And so at each stage, the foundations for success uh, are driving those outcomes. And then things accumulate over time. That's the little purple arrows. The best predictor of your grade nine um, outcomes on your achievement tests scores is not any of the factors that you can measure with contemporaneous surveys. The best predictor is the scores from the year before, the scores from the year before. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and indeed, some provinces will link data from one cycle to the next. Um, and certainly with the EYE, we like to be able to see how well kids are doing in kindergarten and how well they're doing two or three years later. So that's the cumulative development piece. The orange arrows, the curved ones, are biological embedding, which I'll explain in a minute. And then as kids move along, especially, well, as early as the end of age two, there are selection forces that come into play. Kids get selected to the best early childhood centers, except here in, in Edmonton Catholic, where they're very, they're very inclusive, and they, they don't try to just accept the, the brightest kids. Um, and I'm sure that's the case for, for many of the centers where, where you're all working. And then age five, that selection becomes more intense, and so on as you go through. And in Latin America, that's really a big deal. There's, there's so many. If, if I'd shown you one of those school profile graphs, like I showed you for Alberta, you just see these stark divides between rural schools, urban public schools, and the private schools. They're really big separations. So I'm going to talk about this first stage from birth uh, at birth. You want healthy pregnancies, healthy deliveries, and some of the foundations for success um, during the prenatal stage, nutrition, no exposure to toxins, um, mother's physical health, emotional health, good care in, in health care centers, community support. I, I was involved with a group uh, called the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and there were about 20 of us that met three times a year, and we had a program for 10 years on socioeconomic gradients, and the idea was what, are, what is it about our Canadian society or other society that establish these gradients between outcomes and socioeconomic status? So those first slides that I showed you with that, that line showing here's that relationship between, between educational achievement and, and socioeconomic status, we call that a gradient. And the idea is to raise that gradient up and to level it, or we use the expression raising and leveling the learning bar. That's the name of our company. All right. So we say, how do those things get ingrained and encultured in a system, embedded in a system? Well, first is through biological embedding. We say differential social experiences get under the skin in early life and through their effects on developing neurobiological pathways affect later trajectories in human health, learning, and behavior. So by differential social experiences, um, when you look at the Canadian population, women who are from higher social class backgrounds are more likely to breastfeed their babies um, and less likely to smoke during pregnancy. So right off the bat, you can see things that are biologically embedded. We also have alcohol use and all other kinds of prescription, non-prescription drug use and so on that is related to social class and so on. Getting under the skin means that there are things that happen during that pregnancy that will lend the child to be vulnerable in the longer term. There's just been an explosion of work in the neurosciences now 
talking about biological embedding. There's chemical signatures that get attached to the genes. That's maybe things don't show up immediately, but they might show up further down the road. There's some large-scale population studies. There's work by a guy named Barker who talked about the Barker hypothesis, showing that the environment during the prenatal stage has some long-term consequences on children's health and behavior. There's a, a study on the Dutch famine where there was a period of three or four months where there's famine in, in Netherlands, and then you could see that dip in outcomes later on down the road. So, um, and then you, after the child's born, they're born with billions of neurons, and during the course of development, these neurons form connections that uh, form synapses. And as these synapses are being formed, part of that brain gets developed, and other synapses get, other neurons get pruned away. We call that the wiring or sculpting of the brain. If any of us uh, put on an eye patch for four or five months and you take that patch away, um, you'll regain sight in that eye in a couple of days. But there's critical periods in a child's development where if they have an eye patch, that part of the brain doesn't get developed and those neurons get pruned away. And so then they have a permanent disability in that eye. So children are learning right from the get-go. There's a woman um, at University of British Columbia who introduces babies to Hindi sounds. These are not Hindi-speaking kids, families. But, um, and then at nine months, before they've even said their first word, those children can still identify, distinguish between Hindi sounds and English sounds. Um, Janet Worker is the woman who did that work. Uh, so there's a whole lot goes on right from the get-go. Even at birth, one day after birth, this is work done at Queen's, a baby can recognize the difference between his or her mother's voice and the voice of another female. So things are, happen during that stage. So we have the birth, outcome, the birth prosperity outcomes and the age two prosperity outcomes and the drivers of those outcomes. This is one of my favorite graphs. I think it's probably 10 years old, but I always like to show it. It's work from Susan Huttenlocker at the University of Chicago, and she brings um, we children in with their mothers and has them in a play-based setting, and she monitors children's vocabulary growth from about 12 months through to uh, two or three years. And so she takes um, a measurement each time they come in. They come in every two months, so you got a measurement at 12 months, 14 months, 16 months, so on, and then we draw the trajectory uh, showing the rate of development of vocabulary skills. And so you can see that there's about, I don't know, 25 children, something like that. Those are their trajectories of their growth in vocabulary. And, I mean, it's amazing when you look at those bottom two kids, uh, they're boys. Uh, at the end of 26 months, they've only got about 100 to 150 words, where there's some other kids there with seven and 800 words. That's a huge variation when you think about it. And there's a nice little formula there for the average growth trajectory, which is, are you ready? Get your pen down. Oh, uh, the average trajectory is described by a nice little equation. You can take the child's age in months, subtract 12, square it, and double it. And you get roughly the number of words. So for example, at um, 24 months, two years old, Subtract 12, why 12? Because that's typically when kids say their first word. Um, square it, you get 144. And double it, you get 288. So if you go up at 24 months to the black line and go across, you'll find that um, that uh, child at 24 months will typically know around 288, 300 words. Now I noticed my friend Scott Tumbach there, he picked up his calculator and he's figuring he should know two billion words by now. <laughs> But uh, you'll see later that it rises up and levels off. Uh, so all this to say there are sensitive periods in development during those first two years. This, this is a slide that comes from uh, the Council for Early Childhood Development in the US. But it shows that most of those pe things peaked in those first two
two or three years of life. Well, the, the Minister of Education, when I was going through this with her in Guatemala, she said, but don't you believe in resilience? Can't these kids get back on the pathway? And I said, well, it's, it's pessimistic because these things are permanent. You know, when you think of, say, fetal alcohol syndrome or the effects of drug use during pregnancy or really poor environments during those first two years. The way I like to look at it is, and the way I described to her is I said, you know, when that sperm hits that egg, you might have had a Ronaldo being born, famous football player. But I, I looked up to find out who the Guatemalan one was. I don't remember his name now. You might have had a Ronaldo being born, but, and, and there's probably a range there of great football skills of that child that's been conceived. But if they don't have a good prenatal environment, that range comes down. And then if you don't have a good environment age two to three, the range comes even lower. Now you can still have, a range, there's still a range there and, and good developmental things the rest of the time determines where that child lands in that range. But you're probably not gonna have a Ronaldo anymore and you're not gonna have a child who's um, gonna be a Nobel Prize winner in physics if they don't have a good prenatal environment, good environment, good. Seems obvious, but Again, when we look at our assessment strategies, we, we say, oh, how many level five and level six kids do we have in PISA? But you've got to look at the long chain of events up till there. So cumulative development. Children develop their skills in a cumulative process as they make the transition from one stage to the next. And they use those skills to, to build upon as they make their way through school. So that's those purple arrows. And now I'm going to have a little aside about the early years evaluation. How many people are familiar with the early years evaluation here? I think, well, well, a good half of you anyway. So this is going to be old news for you folks, but I'll talk a bit about it anyway. Um, so the EYE assesses skills in five developmental areas, awareness of self and environment, social skills and approaches to learning, cognitive skills, language and communication skills, and physical development. It's usually used as part of a transition to school program. We talk about having ready children, ready schools, and ready communities. It has two complementary components, a direct assessment where someone sits down with the child and does it in a very direct way. And then we have the early years evaluation teacher assessment where teachers will observe children for five or six weeks at the beginning of the school year, and then they go online and they uh, score their children in each of several, several domains. Uh, we generate reports at the individual child level uh, that a lot of teachers will use in their early discussions with parents to talk about what their strengths and weaknesses are and so on. I have to have, a, not, now I gave you a little go with the Hutton Locker story, but I have to show you the model for um, that we use for predicting uh, kids' learning needs as they enter school. So what we did was we were able to link children's early years evaluation scores with reading scores in grade two and grade three and determine how predictive they were of their later reading scores. So we have a nice little model here. It looks very complicated. It's a logistic regression. and. Um, for those of you who are not too statistically inclined, I'll work you through it. It's not as complicated as it looks. It says probability that y, that's the outcome, would be a reading score, equals one, that means passing in say your grade three reading test versus zero, not passing. And that vertical bar says given, given x, given the EYE scores, is equal to that nice function there, which is a logistic function. One over one plus the x monent of minus z, where z is that list of factors, that's the EYE scores. And what you want to focus on here is the weights. And reading scores are most highly related to cognitive skills in the EYE domains. Next is language and communication skills. My colleague Beth calls it Doug's recipe. You got a cup of cognitive skills, three quarters of a cup of language skills. Maybe I should have started there. Um, and a quarter cup of fine motor, 25th of a cup of awareness, and social skills and approaches to learning all, also figure in. 
And these are all put in together, so these are the effects after controlling for all the other effects that are in there. And you know what's really interesting is you saw the Hutton Locker data, and I don't know if you noticed that uh, the girls' lines were in one color and the boys are in another. And girls, we have more girls at the top in the language skills than boys. And indeed, if you look at EYE skills, there are more girls with strong language skills and even cognitive skills than in, as in kindergarten. And as you know, when you get to grade three, girls tend to have, on average, much better reading skills than boys. But when you put gender into this model, it doesn't come out as significant. Why is that? Because these measures already embody the advantages that girls have as they enter school. Okay? And we've even, well, actually we've got data from Alberta where we have, uh, we're able to link postal codes to socioeconomic status. It's kind of a weak measure. It's not as good as the measure of socioeconomic status in PISA. But um, even socioeconomic status, the effects of those first few stages are embodied in that five set of domain scores. So when we do that probability, we actually get an estimate. It sounds kind of harsh in a way to say this child has a 40% chance of having a good reading score. This child has an 80% chance. Um, but like many of these schooling outcomes, the distribution is negatively skewed. I mean, most kids are bunched up at the top. And so we set cut points of 80%. And we say those are kids with tier one learning needs. And we set it quite high. Why? Because we don't want kids falling through the cracks. Right? We want, if we say you're green, you're green, and you're almost for sure going to have good reading skills come grade three. We've got another group that has a probability between 50 and 80% that we call tier two, having tier two learning needs. And it's important, I'm, I, I have to be careful because it's so easy to say it's a tier two child. You've got to say child with tier two learning needs. All right? because that can change, and that's the whole idea of what many of you do, is to move them from tier two to tier, uh, from tier two to tier one, or from tier three to tier two. And then you've got children with tier three learning needs. These children need a much more intensive intervention, typically an hour a day of augmentative instruction, something over and above what they're getting in the regular classroom. And a lot of these children have, um, uh, you know, real learning issues that are biologically embedded, if you will. Um, but they can still move along the learning pathway and develop skills, and, and many of them do learn how to read. The other thing about this business is we've been, we've been able lately to put uh, an age level for each of our items on the EYE. So we could say, you know, at what age, on average, do kids, um, are kids able to count to 10? At what age are they able to recognize these familiar animals and so on? And, and at the same time, we can look at all the domains. When I look at the range of ages for the EYE scores, and this is really important to this whole story, is they range, you have some kids up in there who are five years old, but they've got the skills of six years old. There's some kids who going to school already knowing how to read. When you get down to tier two, kids who are five years old, but they have skills more like a four-year-old, and then you've got kids down to tier one who are five years old, but they have skills of a three-year-old. So imagine this heterogeneous group of kids going into grade one, some of them with skills that are consistent with three and four-year-olds, and then they gotta learn how to read. And, it's, and that's, that's the challenge of the early, early teaching. Foundations for success. So in addition to the effects that are biologically embedded, you have factors that um, are directly affected by the foundations for success at each stage of development. So when this minister asked me, well, don't you believe in uh, resilience? Yeah, I believe in resilience, but resilience doesn't it's not all a personal attribute of the child. You know, Americans right now are obsessed with this idea of grit, and everybody's running around measuring grit. But resilience has to do with kids having the resources, i.e., the foundations, brought to them consistently year to year, 
that's what makes a huge difference. And, and in addition, you know, I don't disbelieve in grit, but it's not all about a particular child's attributes. Resilience is about having the right kinds of resources brought to bear along the educational pathway. So those are the green boxes uh, that affect a child's development all the way along. So you might ask me, how did you decide what to include as the foundations for success? Because remember in the quest for school effects, there's a long laundry list of factors, everything from you know, principals' leadership and teachers' years of experience and professional development, coming to workshops like today and so on. And we boil it down to these five factors. The quality instruction, which is always, in the literature, is always the number one factor. Having good material resources. Having an inclusive school context. Family involvement and learning time. And we say that those foundations are potent. They have strong effects on the outcomes. So if you go to the literature and you can say, those are the things that matter. There's a, a, a big body of literature on each one of these. You can go to a book like uh, John Hattie's Visible Learning and you'll see the effects of factors like these. They're pervasive, meaning that they not only affect one of those outcomes in the middle, but a whole range of outcomes. So having good quality of instruction not only affects academic achievement, but it also affects children's well-being, their attainment at school, and the extent to which they're engaged. And finally, they're proximal. Now, proximal means that there's nothing in between them and the outcome, right? So having good quality of instruction has a very direct relationship on student outcomes. Something like principal's leadership, or being, where's, being a regional director, those have indirect effects, still important, but they only have a principal's, having a good principal in the school Principal leadership is only important if that principal brings about changes in those foundations, brings about better quality instruction, more engagement, more learning time, and so on. So when you, when you start to map these things out, you can say, well, what is it about quality instruction? What is it we need in our school to bring about better quality instruction? Well, we need principal leadership. We may need some specific kinds of training, and so on. So there's, there's arrows out there beyond the foundations but as a framework for assessment, you've got to keep your eye on those five foundations. I got onto this idea a little bit further in the work in Saskatchewan. They had a minister who, of health who brought in this model called Hoshin Kanri. It's a Japanese management model. Back to Japan, or you're Japanese kid, I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, and um, so in Saskatchewan now, they use those five foundation factors, and kind of like that's, that's the minister's dashboard, if you will. Focus on those five foundations and those four outcomes. So amongst their 28 divisions there, they have one of the division directors who's in charge of quality instruction. And his or her job, as a committee of four or five people, is to make sure that everyone from the minister to the ministry staff to the other directors to the principals to the teachers say, this is how we're defining quality instruction. This is what we mean by it. Here's our baseline. And here's, here's how things are going forward. So they're really focused on change in year to year of the prosperity outcomes and the foundations. So in a way, it's, it's like a strategic plan for a company. You, you can't focus on everything. Focus on the things that, that are really important. Oh, and I just stuck this one in there because this is what I talked about at 7 o'clock this morning with the folks in Paris and Educational Testing Service and Princeton and so on. So for PISA for development, we have three measures of achievement, math, science, and reading. We only have one measure of engagement, four measures of health and well-being, two of which are coming from PISA, from, uh, from the R school surveys, and then uh, and one measure of attainment. And then we have these other measures of of the foundations around the outside. So this is a big change for PISA. It's, Pisa's this giant ocean liner, and just to try to move them 10 degrees to starboard or port is, is a difficult process. So we're, we're really excited that this is in, embedded now in PISA for development, and they've announced that it's going to be part of P2 
PISA in 2021. PISA 2018 is already in the planning stages. So the next phase is um, when kids go, enter school and need to learn how to read. And reading is the fundamental task of those first three years. I, I even put it ahead in numeracy skills. Not that I think you should ignore numeracy skills, but you cannot, can't go very far in math, really beyond grade three, if you, if you haven't learned to read well. So we started a project, I think, five years ago called Confident Learners. And we're, it was a whole school literacy program for First Nations on reserve schools. We worked with 32 schools for a period of three years actually developing the program. And then in the last two years, we've been continuing to develop it further um, into our work at the Learning Bar. And actually now we're starting to see a bit of spillover from early years evaluation into confident learners and, and back the other way, especially around learning activities, which I'll talk about. So confident learners, the initiative that brings to bear the science of learning how to read, a rigorous curriculum aligned with teaching activities and assessments, quality professional development, and the support of communities and families. There's where we are. There's some of the schools up in northern Alberta that uh, are part of it. One that's really taking off right now is Tall Cree, and we're working closely with them. We have a number in Saskatchewan, Ontario, and, and, and the Maritimes. Well, when we started, we looked at a lot of different models of reading instruction. Uh, there's a searchlight model in the UK, and there's numerous models in the literature. But this model called the Sybil View of Reading is the one that we landed on. It says that reading success depends on these two complementary components. It involves code-related skills, the ability to decode words, sound them out, and language skills, being able to understand and interpret spoken language. So, spoken and written language. So, if you, uh, those of you on your laptop, you Google on Sybil View of Reading, you'll get a lot of images that look like this. They won't call it the deficit approach. I've added that label. But you've got language skills, and I put it on, I put the axis, I put 20 points on the axis on language and 20 on code, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And where you want to be is you want kids, of course, to have high language skills and high code-related skills. They would be green on the EYE. Why? Because they had good cognitive skills and good language skills, and learning, they're learning to read. You get a number of kids in that bottom right quadrant who have strong language skills, but don't learn to decode. And indeed, a lot of the kids who, who fail to learn to read that are otherwise seemingly pretty able kids, it's quite often they've got a specific learning disability and they don't learn to decode. Usually those kids, if they're given very targeted instruction on how to relate letters to sounds, learn blends, learn that words are composed, so they need to be explicitly taught which back in my day was called phonics, but we're a little more sophisticated now, um, that they can make very rapid progress in just a few years. You don't get too many kids up in the upper left quadrant, except in Alberta, you know, we have a lot of new immigrants. They can have good code-related skills, but haven't learned the language yet. But they, and they too will make quick progress as they learn the language. But the, a lot of the children are down in that bottom left quadrant who have learning disabilities, might have intellectual disabilities, something on the autism spectrum, kids who have had very poor environments growing up, and so on. And the, some of those would be kids in red in the EYE, kids who start school um, with you know one or two years behind in their development. So watch my sleight of hand now. Um, maybe focus on those four kids at the bottom left there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to change the position of the dots. They're exactly the same dots, same placement. All I'm doing is I'm moving the axes. So I move that middle axis to the left and the other one to the bottom. Completely different picture, isn't it? And so now those four kids at the bottom are not in deficit. That one there is at level seven in language, and level two in coding. What does that child need to do to go to level eight in language? Level three in coding. I liken it to, my colleagues at the Learning Bar are sick of hearing this story. 
I liken it to Red Cross swimming badges. You know how in Red Cross they start off with, you know, you're a starfish, and then you become a minnow, and eventually you become a whale, and then you've got 12 levels of skills going up the ladder, and then eventually on to bronze medallion and, and so on. But I can go to any kid on my street and I could say, what level are you in in, the, in your swimming classes? And they can tell you immediately. I've, I've even tried it recently with some friends. Well, I'm at level three. But what do you need to do to go to level four? Well, I need to be able to swim four lengths of the pool. I need to be able to tread water for 15 minutes and so on. It's very transparent. They know exactly what they need to do. So I thought, why can't reading be that transparent? So I hired three literacy experts for a year. It wasn't long enough. We extended it to two years eventually. And we amassed all the curricula from the 10 provinces in, in language arts for grades kindergarten, from kindergarten through to grade three. Uh, one from one of the territories. There was a good one from California. There was another one from the UK and so on. And we had this giant wall chart to map out the skills and put them in the right sequence, going from beginning of kindergarten to the end of grade three. Some of the reading people say, no, you can't do that because kids develop skills at different times. I don't care about that because I know from the EYE I can put specific age ranges on skills. And so we developed this whole domain of skills, and then the idea was to have parse them up into these 20 steps, 20 steps of language, 20 steps of coding. So code-related skills, or you might see the term decoding in the literature rather than coding. Coding is a little more universal. And these are some familiar things you've heard about, concepts about print, phonological awareness, letter knowledge, and reading fluency. And so we mapped all these things out. And I sat with them for a week. Um, just so happens that one of them is in Portugal. So we sat in a nice place in Portugal. We worked really hard every day, I, I promise. <laughs> and uh, we mapped out these, all the skills for coding. And then I put them in, and then I went home and I put them into a histogram. And so the histogram looked like this. Very few skills in kindergarten in the curricula, in the Canadian curricula. A lot of skills in grade one, and then not so many in grade two, and then grade three, they're kind of you're moving on into speed and prosody, moving on into more uh, higher level skills, word recognition, spelling, and so on. So I call this the reading mountain because most of the skills are bunched up in grade one. And I said, no, 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 we gotta, we got to push the mountain down. Oh, boy, did we ever have some fights? Because they said, no, no, but they should be able to do this by the end of grade two. They must be able to do this by the middle of grade, uh, by the middle of grade one, and so on. And, and it's so hard to get out of that grade-based thinking. So I said, no, we've we got to push the mountain down. So we pushed the mountain down. This is what it looks like. 14 skills in each of the steps. And it's no, you don't see grades on the bottom now. So think of this child who's age five, but has the skills of a four-year-old going, going into grade one and encountering the reading mountain. Maybe that child's only at step four in coding. Or that child needed to go to step five, step six, and so on. And then similarly, we have language skills, vocabulary, receptive language, expressive language, and written language. And we've got, again, 20 steps, 14 outcomes in each step. Um, the bottom two steps, actually, where did Peter go? Peter was heavily involved in the development of this. We've got, for each of the steps, we have three themes. So we've got 60 themes, two for each step. So in the kitchen, colors, shapes, and so on, in the schoolyard. And so there's different themes that they learn in, at each of the steps. And in addition, we looked at the rate at which killed children develop those language, develop words, learning words, not on that rapid trajectory like Scott Thunbach is, but how do they grow from age four or five? Actually, we start down at age three because we want the low steps to be really easy. And we have um, what are called AOA words, age of acquisition words. Oh, I just, I just gave you honorable mention for all the work that you did on this confident learners. Um, so our AOA words, age of acquisition, is what age do kids typically acquire certain words? And so a word like 
vocabulary might have an age of acquisition of 11, 11.2 or something. We have a corpus of some 30,000 words, and so we can identify what, not only when they're acquired, but also how frequently they're used in everyday text. Word like birthday, big word, but it has a very low AOA, age of acquisition. So we've positioned 60 words at each step, and so we really want to build kids' knowledge as they're going along. So now you might ask me, what has this to do with First Nations schools? First of all, a lot of those children are coming to school with relatively low skills and need, need a boost, if you will. Um, and it's not anything to do with being indigenous, it's more to do with poverty and so on. Um, so we, they, need a, they need a leg up. And so, but they also need um, a curriculum that's grounded in their culture. So for each of the 14 times 20 is 280 code-related skills, and each of the 280 language skills, we have learning activities. This was an ongoing enterprise um, in the development of, of confident learners. We now have over 600 activities that are related one to one for each of those activities. And, um, and those activities are culturally related. So we have one, for example, crossing the stream. The teacher can put some stepping stones on the stream and the kids have to say the letters to cross the stream. Or there might be sounds of letters or blends or whatever. We've got a whole, a whole bunch of them, a word hunt, for example. But they're all kind of grounded in so-called Aboriginal ways of knowing. So I've got this one as a precursor to the next couple of slides. When we looked in our National Longitudinal Survey and we looked at kids' trajectories, these are like the hunt and locker trajectories, but now these ones are math skills. And I divided them up by how well the kids could read at age six age seven. And you can see they rise up and level off, but as they're rising up and leveling off, they're getting much wider. So around a grade three, if you go to a grade three classroom, you've usually got a range of skills. Some kids are at the grade one level, some are at the grade five level. By the time you get to grade nine or grade 10, it's four grade levels plus or minus. You'll have grade nine kids with skills of a grade four or grade five kid She's nodding. She must, you must have been a high school teacher at some point. And you've got some kids that could probably handle university material. It's a huge variation. So one of the big factors is building success with quality instruction. We've been modifying our measures of quality instruction. We now have a, a very good model based on structured teaching. Um, one of the big Hattie factors, John Hattie. And we measure this and tell them for me, but here's what it looks like when kids rate quality of instruction as they're going through. Precipitous decline for both boys and girls. Valuing schooling outcomes, same thing, falling off. And that's, you know, that's, a, that's been apparent in the our school surveys for, for several years. Effective learning time at the secondary level, also falling off. We're working on a research project Called, we call it the year nine dip. We're now calling it the year 10 dip, but <laughs> the idea is it falls off and then some of them go back up again, what we call. But it's so consistent. It's consistent in Australia, New Zealand, all across Canada, wherever we're doing the Our School Survey, you see this falling off. Another way to say it is our schools just aren't working from about half of our kids. And think about what half those are and what their beginnings were <laughs> from the get-go. Those are, you know, quality instruction is the, the most important foundation for success. In Alberta, we, uh, another uh, hallmark of Alberta is we started this school completion survey uh, as part of our school surveys in Alberta. And we identified five types of students based on their assets, uh, personal assets, demographic, academic, extent to which they're engaged in mental health and the learning climate of the school. And we ended up with these five types of students. The first one, which is, if you look at the second, uh, second row from the bottom, 32% of students. And these are the kids who we all love to love. 
Each of those scores are on a 10 point scale. So we have their grades, 8.6 out of 10, mostly A's. These are your A students. A little bit low on social engagement. Institutional engagement's high, their intellectual engagement's high, and their mental health is high. Then you've got this next group, which is a, a curious group in a way. They're what we call disconnected kids. They're just at that cusp between an A and B, but they're not socially engaged. And they also have very poor mental health. Um, guy in Quebec, uh, an academic named Michel Janos, who did some very nice work, longitudinal work looking at kids' skills from high school and then whether they completed school or not. He calls this group the quiets. And they're the quiets in that teachers often don't worry about them. They got good grades and so on, but many of them have um, some problems in, with anxiety and depression. Then you got your disengaged students. These are students who still have good grades, but they just turned off school. My son who's in grade 12, I asked him the other day, how, you, how, how are things going? Oh, he says, I have senioritis. And I said, what's that? It's me who should have senioritis. They said, no, it's when you're a senior in school and you just don't care about it anymore. You just want June to come and it to be all over. Uh, so I hope you'll, uh, hope you'll graduate. Um, but he, um, no, he, yeah, his grades are up in that range, but um, he, he certainly not inspired by it all. He's not what we call intellectually engaged. Yeah, look at that, intellectual engagement, 5.5. Now she's more socially engaged. Shouldn't be talking about my own kids, but it's hard, to, hard not to sometimes. Um, struggling kids, the last two groups, see that 17%, 9%, those are your vulnerable kids. When could we identify them? Right at early years evaluation, right? And some of them are struggling. The difference is one group has mental, good mental health, the other doesn't. And that's what really struck me when I first did this work is because often with those, that last group of kids, the ones that are really disengaged from school, have very low grades, we don't think so much about their mental health, but they have very high levels of anxiety and depression. So I'm gonna go quickly because I think we're running short of time here. I just wanted to say a little bit about selection, that as kids are making their way through school, they get put into certain kinds of schools, things like charter schools, for example. Um, and so we talk about, as I mentioned earlier, horizontal segregation versus vertical segregation. Some school systems are, they stream kids at a very early age, like Germany and Austria, they put them into a program that streams them into the gymnasium schools or the Hauptschule of the academic bound schools or the vocational schools. We don't do that in Canada, but time they reach high school, there are some subtle and not so subtle selection processes. You overlay that with charter schools and private schools and so on. Schooling systems that have, I did a paper for Teachers College Record and showed that schooling systems that are more inclusive, that is have less vertical segregation, less horizontal segregation, tend to have better results. So there's the profile for Canada. I'll remind you of the profile for Alberta, which is pretty inclusive. And then here's that showing that decline in achievement when you have high horizontal or vertical segregation. Here's a nice little map. We have maps like this for most of Alberta now, because most of you are using EYE. And this was a map that Calgary gave us permission to use. And, um, and you can see, um, the levels of disparities between differences among the schools, say in that northeast corner compared with the rest of Calgary. I always imagine two kindergarten teachers waking up in the morning and one of them goes to one of those schools down below where there's 80%, 80% of the kids are green. And the other one goes up to the northwest where one of them, where 75% of them are red or yellow. And I say, they have a different job description <laughs> entirely. They both call themselves kindergarten teachers. But one comes, oh, I'm just a sore neck and tired. <laughs> the other one's coming home. Yeah, we had a great fundraiser today and parents were in. <laughs> it's just totally different on so many different characteristics. So. so here's the summary slide. And you can think of that 
outcomes at birth and we know what kinds of things we need to measure um, of those early development skills. There's the Hutton Locker graph next that leads to the EYE probability of school completion. Then they hit the reading mountain. And then the next one shows what the results of not making it over the reading mountain are as kids go through school. They either stay on a very flat trajectory and don't make much growth or they tend to continue up and, and do well. And then finally we can talk about their interest and engagement in school. That last graph is in our school graph on interest and motivation where a lot of the kids are just falling off because they're no longer interested. So I showed at the very beginning of this deck, and I didn't mention it, it's a little boy in Saskatchewan coming home from his first day at school. And um, this is about uh, three years old. So he's in the class of 2021. All of our children and confident learners, we, we say right from kindergarten, well, you're in the class of 2021. I mean, that's when you're gonna graduate and kind of get that idea ingrained in their head. And so this kid's in the class of 2021, I believe. Something like that. And right now, uh, in, well, in both Saskatchewan and Alberta, that child, if things stay the way they are, would have only about a 30 to 35% chance of graduating in 2021. Um, but I've been known to be a pathological optimist, and I think uh, he has a good chance. Why? Because of strong leadership, and I know we have some really strong leaders here, dedicated teachers, family and community support, and a relentless focus on building the foundations for success. Great. Thank you.